Good morning, everyone, and afternoon and evening for some of you. Um, I just want to do a quick mic check before we get started. So if you guys are hearing me okay, just let me know in our chat. And say hello if you're here. It looks like we have about seven people in, uh, attending right now. So if you're signed in, go ahead and say hello in the chat box. So uh, before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about, a, uh, actually about a couple of things. Hi, Susan. Hi, Beth. Welcome. Um, first off, and I'll, I'll repeat this at the end, but um, next week um, on Sunday, um, we're going to actually have our critique on Sunday because next week I have a baby shower. <laughs> being thrown on Saturday. So this was in our calendar, but um, just I wanted to remind everyone. So you actually have an extra day to work. Um, you don't have to turn in your homework until Saturday um, next weekend. So take advantage of that. And, um, and then we'll meet at our usual time, but it'll be on Sunday. And I'm sorry for those of you who attend service or anything, um, if it's during that time, we will uh, have the recordings available for you guys who can't attend live. So just uh, keep that in mind. Hi, Angela and Jenny, welcome. So um, another thing I wanted to bring up is that um, almost everyone, <laughs> pretty much almost everyone who submitted homework um, wrote a little disclaimer um, about their work. They said, oh, this is just awful. I'm almost embarrassed to turn this in. You know, this was really hard. It's not finished you know, apologies and all that sort of thing. And I just wanted to remind everyone that this is not about creating a finished masterpiece each week. Um, the painting, you know, normally like in my other classes, if you've taken them, we've worked on more of like a finished piece throughout the whole class. Um, and of course, you know, we had like anywhere between four to 10 weeks to develop a single piece. Um, this week, the class, I mean, this class in particular, we have a week for each piece. And really it's just about color, and uh, understanding color and getting uh, more familiar with mixing color. So in all Prima too, just in general, is very challenging. Um, and just because I do my painting in a few hours, you know, I'm actually pushing myself really hard to work that quickly. Um, it's not comfortable for me either, but you have to remind yourself that these are just studies. Okay, so they don't have to be perfect. They don't by any means have to look finished. Um, and while of course we all want to have a, a great painting that we're proud of, just try to remind yourself of that because we are our own worst critic. We are the hardest on ourselves. And um, you know, everyone actually did a really good job of capturing the likeness of the model. And um, we're gonna just mostly focus on talking about <clears throat> color and the flesh tone mixtures each week. So do your personal best, of course, but don't feel bad or feel like you don't want to turn in homework just because, you know, it didn't come up to your own personal standards because I realize this class is very challenging and the timeline is very tight. Um, so another thing I wanted to mention is that the final two weeks, so week five and six of this class, we will be working on a single painting. So you will have more time um, and I also wanted to let everyone know that if you want, I'm going to provide some photo reference for the, the final, some new reference for the final, um, two weeks, because we're going to talk about using creative color in painting, um, those final two weeks. So I will have some, uh, really interesting photographs with different colored gel, uh, lighting on the model. But if you guys want to work on your own reference, um, like take a self-portrait or if you want to work, you know, from uh, a model of your own, then you are more than welcome to do that. Or you are also welcome to revisit any of these portraits um, and rework them for the last two weeks. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, so for those of you who would like, you know, to revisit any one of these, you are more than welcome to do that for the final two weeks of class. So maybe start thinking about that. Um, and I also thought about possibly releasing some of those photo references a little early. So those of you who like to spend more time on your drawing uh, can um, in the meantime. So if you guys would like that, just let me know. 
and I'll send out the photo references for the final two weeks. Um, I don't want you to start your color part um, of the portrait, but you could start your drawing and your underpainting if you'd like. Um, so just keep that in mind. I realize that the timeline is pretty tight, but I don't want anyone to feel like they shouldn't turn in their homework. Um, this is really about learning. Um, you know, we're focused on color. So think of these as like, as if you did a little color study for a portrait that you're maybe going to redo um, at a larger scale. So think about it that way, and that might help you kind of loosen up a little bit. Um, and also I wanted to mention that you'll see that in this week's demonstration for medium flesh tones, I actually leave the painting a little bit looser. And I did that intentionally because I wanted everyone to see that you don't have to have everything smoothed out. Um, the reason I did it in the first one is because I do get a lot of questions about tiling and blending um, as a way of moving forward um, in a multi-layer painting. Um, and I know some of you had questions too about, you know, if I wanted to go back in and edit this painting or I worked on this over several days, is that okay? Yes, that's fine. You don't have to sit down and do this in one sitting because that's a lot of work to do. Um, on top of the color mixing and the drawing and everything. So uh, just keep that in mind. And if you want to leave your paintings on the looser side, that is perfectly fine. Try to keep it um, more about the color and what, you lear what you're learning about color. Um, think of it kind of like taking a workshop. When you go to a, uh, like a two-day workshop that's really intensive, you don't put the expectation on yourself to walk away with a masterpiece, even though, of course, we always want that. But just keep that in mind. I don't want anyone to feel bad about what they're doing because if you're frustrated, it most likely means that you're learning. And that's a good thing. Um, so when we get out of our comfort zone and we challenge ourselves, you're learning. And that's really the key here. Okay? So it looks like a few of you would like to receive the references early. So um, I will send those out um, this week so you can start to look through them. Um, and again, you, if you wanted to take your own photo reference um, or you have one, you can send it to me. Um, I prefer to be able to look at it first and let you know if it's a good one for the purpose of the class. Um, so just keep that in mind and you guys can email those to me if you have like a reference in mind that you would like to paint. Okay, because sometimes it is easier to paint someone that you know or um, you know something that interests you a little bit more. All right, so... And Jenny, I see your, your comment uh, that you nearly didn't turn in your homework. <laughs> and I think, and it's funny because I think everyone probably felt that way um, on their own. But I just want to let everyone know that pretty much everyone in the class felt that way. So, but as you can see here, everyone did a great job. Um, everyone captured a likeness of the model. We're going to dive into color a little more in depth um, in the coming weeks. So... You know, there's like last week we had the lecture on, um, so, oh, we talked about color zones of the face last week. So this week we're talking about um, the undertones and uh, how to determine what an undertone is. Um, so you're going to kind of be layering more information each week um, into what we're learning. And again, the focus is on color. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in. Um, so we're going to start with you, Kathy. Are you here? I know some of you couldn't attend. Still have summer things going on, and that's fine. Um, I'll post a link to this recording uh, in the forum after. Okay, so... I just wanted to say, also, because some of you said, Oh, I got the face painting but, but painted, but the rest is unfinished. That's okay. If you have to just focus on the head, that I would rather you do that than try to rush through and, and finish the whole painting. The, the idea is that you're, you know, taking the time to mix the colors and study and, and that sort of thing. Okay, so um, Kathy, this looks really nice. I think you captured a lot of her kind of natural um, tonality and, and the values seem pretty good. Um, I'm just kind of going to take a survey. I think what I'm noticing is that you have actually some really nice um, 
mid-tones on this side of the face as that transitions from the shadow. But on the left side, I think we could have maybe pushed the values a little bit darker to kind of sculpt that lower form. So um, then that's often a challenge because whenever you have someone who's really fair and they're like kind of against a dark background, we perceive those edges in the, the cheek as being really bright. But if you actually look at the model here, from right around this zone here, down into the, the lower chin, so this little sliver here, is actually quite a bit darker. Um, and that's because she, and she has very defined cheekbones. That's one of the reasons I picked her as a model. I thought she had a really interesting face shape. Um, and you don't often see this kind of chiseled uh, cheekbone shape um, in a lot of women. They often have a much more rounded kind of form. Um, I mean, that's a big generalization, but you know, in general, uh, in general terms, that's often true. Um, but she has these very obvious like side planes. You can really, really see that um, in this reference. Um, so if we take a look to, I think the shadows maybe got a little hot um, in color and that could be this camera, but I think in general they could be a little bit darker. So what I want to do is just take a couple of uh, color samples. I'm trying out a new brush set I just bought. It's called Sargent's Oils. It's kind of interesting. I'm still getting used to it. but um, So what I'm going to do is just take a quick sample of your average flesh tone for the shadow mask. So maybe I'll take something like this. I'm going to put a little sample here and then we're going to compare it to the models here in the same kind of area. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a pretty significant value difference um, and also the, the kind of temperature is a little bit more um, cool and also the chroma. So when we talked about in early on in the, uh, the first lecture about hue, value, and chroma, um, the chroma in this red is much lower because it, it has a little bit more blue in it. So actually, if you would take the color that you had mixed, um, this color here, let me grab a pen real quick. So if you take this color, and you add like maybe a little ultramarine blue, you should end up with something close to that. Um, and so that could, it could be that it looks like maybe you used a little too much cad red. And something to think about too that we are all um, kind of challenged by is if we are working on from a different monitor, the colors might be slightly different. Um, if we're working from a print, um, different printers print differently. So keep that in mind. So when I'm giving you these suggestions, I'm not expecting you to go in and make these corrections. That's completely optional. Um, I just mostly want to kind of help you sharpen your eye and pay attention to how we perceive those, those colors. Uh, Annie, you had a question. How do I pick up the color in Procreate? Um, actually, it, so I use an Apple Pencil when I'm doing the writing and the drawing, but if you actually use your fingertip and you just tap and hover, it will select the color. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, so I, I realize that there might be slight differences between maybe how this photo reference appears to you um, here on the screen versus maybe how you were using um, if you were using like your iPad or if you were using a different tablet or a different monitor. So I mentioned this for everyone. If I bring up your image and it looks drastically different than how your painting feels in real life, like in terms of color um, or value, let me know and I can make some kind of tweaks here in the program and try and get it a little closer to how it feels for you in real life. So um, this here was the shadow color. So I'm just going to keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, I think if you add a little bit ultramarine blue, you're going to end up with something that's much closer and actually it's going to provide the appropriate contrast for the light mass. 
Um, and there's something that uh, Ron just brought up. Um, you have a hard time doing all the pre-mixing. It is a lot of work, um, but it's also excellent practice because when you're painting, we're making so many judgment calls that um, oftentimes we forget to pay attention to the hue, value, chroma, especially value. Um, that's often the first thing that kind of goes out the window. Oh, oh, Kathy, sorry. It says Ron on there, so I was a little confused. <laughs> um, so that's right, I remember now. Um, sorry about that. So yeah, doing all the pre-mixing, it can be really, really um, challenging to do that. And even when I'm doing my pre-mixtures, I often find that when I get to the actual painting part and I'm getting maybe more in depth into some of the nuances that I'm trying to find, like for example in here, finding that, that reflected light color, I often find that I might have to modify it. And in fact, when I filmed, um, I think it was the dark skin uh, demo, when I had started to actually apply some of the shadow color, I realized my, my color was too red. Um, and so that does happen. And all I do is as I'm going through, I start to modify it. Um, I might take my palette knife and mix a new pile, or I might um, start to edit that color and adjust it a little bit as I'm moving forward. Uh, but it's still excellent practice. Um, but if you're, if you're starting to actually paint and things are starting to really feel um, off, you might find yourself wanting to go back in and, and reassess that color. Um, okay, so let's look at, so what I wanna do actually next is um, just make a quick similar comparison between this value here. So we talked about that side plane. So here's some of the color that you have there. And then her, the value here on her cheek. Okay, so here you can see, I'll make that a little bigger. Okay, so here we can see, this is that side plane on the left. Um, you really picked up some of that purple and hers is just a little bit more rosy and it's a little bit darker. It's also a little, well actually you're pretty close to, um, in terms of like the intensity of the chroma, it's just the hue is a little bit more red. Um, so what I would suggest with something like this color is maybe the addition of a little bit of maybe cad red or maybe a touch of burnt sienna. Actually, I, I scrapped the cad red. I think uh, burnt sienna would do it because you kind of want like an earthy red. Um, burnt sienna alone with white would be too hot of a color because it does have that cooling violet gray tone. Um, I think it just, we want it to relate to the other flesh tones maybe just a little bit more. And also it's a big value thing. Um, so if we took this color and just put it there as a sample, you can see the, the value difference. And that's really going to help turn the form. And it's really easy to lose sight of values as we're mixing color. So um, let's see, let's take, so I would say add a little bit of um, burnt sienna. And you would, if you took a little bit of this color because it already has a little blue in it, um, you should end up with something like that. And if it, it ends up going too red, then I would just say maybe add a little bit more um, ultramarine blue if it doesn't quite get closer to that color. And just so uh, those of you who haven't done critiques with me before, um, I do send you these notes after the class. So you'll have um, my notes here. Um, I think your average flesh tone here is actually spot on. Um, it feels really, really close anyway. So let's, let's take a quick look at that. It might be a little on the light side, but I think it's really close. 
Yeah, I think you're really spot on with that. So um, great job with that one. So that one's gets a little check mark. <laughs> um, same thing with the rosy color in the cheeks. I think you're pretty close. Um, let's take a look at that one. Yeah, you might be a little bit on the dark side. I don't know though, you're pretty close. It kind of depends on where we take the color from. Maybe you're just a little bit dark, but it's it's really it's in the same color family. So um, it would just be a matter of adding white um, for the, the kind of apples of the cheek. I think your values in here look really, really good. I'm just kind of looking at the color yeah, I think you're spot on with that one. Here, I'm going to change that background color a little bit to a lighter gray. So some of these colors are a little easier to see. There we go. Um, which area was I? Oh, I was comparing this area here. To a very similar area. Yeah, you're really close. Slight value difference. Um, again, that could be this photograph too. Um, so let me know if it looks a little different um, in person. I think you have some really nice um, neutral colors too. I like some of the, the color you have in here. I just think it probably needs to go a little darker. Again, it's a matter of that underplane. Um, remember, that the face has these side planes that kind of divide here. So anything that's kind of past this point is going to start to get, um, let me draw that in a dark color. So anything past kind of this side plane is going to start to get a little bit darker as it wraps back. And so, and also remember we have that fall off of light kind of happening across the form this way. So really, um, the lighting in here is kind of, it's called butterfly lighting. So you can see, we call it that because there's like this little butterfly shape formed by the shadow in the nose. And it just means that the, the lighting is kind of overhead. Um, this one's maybe slightly to the left um, so it's kind of coming from over here and what that tells us is that those highlights are going to kind of ride the center of the form like almost in a little triangle. So anything that's moving away from those highlights is getting darker. So that's something to keep in mind um, as you're painting. Just think about where you're seeing that the specular highlights and then anything that's moving away is going to grab um, get gradually darker, especially as the form moves this way. So the highlights in the forehead and the cheek are not as intense as the lights in the chin. We do get a tiny little highlight up here, but I don't even think that reaches quite the same value range as you know some of these specular highlights in the nose. For example, that one's almost pure white, has a little color to it, and the forehead. Um, same thing with um, the, the color in the hair. I think maybe because the orange in here is so hot of a color, it might have thrown off some of the other um, values because this is lighter. So you made this lighter and, you know, same thing with the side plane of the hair. So just keep that in mind as you're, um, as you're painting. Really getting that shadow value um, correct is probably one of, it, because it's one of the first things that we do. Um, when we're pre-mixing, um, is it's really crucial to helping you mix your other values, and that's kind of why we key the painting. We, when we're mixing, we mix our, our shadow value first, and then we go and we find either the average flush tone or the highlight color, um, and that kind of helps us find those middle value steps because these midtones are some of the toughest values to find uh, when we're when we're painting. Um, I think your color looks great. She has maybe a touch more of this average flesh tone kind of throughout her portrait. So my suggestion would be to utilize this color 
your average flesh tone a little bit more. Um, let me do a quick paint over for you. Um, so just to show you a couple of areas where I would maybe introduce it. So one of the areas I would probably introduce a little bit more of that deeper flesh tone is right around in this cheek as it transitions out of that pink. So your pink was a little bit also on the darker side, so maybe having another transition tone somewhere in there, but also just taking that warmer kind of peachy average flesh tone and introducing it in a few other areas. Um, I think in the forehead, she actually has a little bit more of that. I like the cooling uh, through the brow ridge, but I think maybe taking that peachy average flesh tone and going in and adding more of that rosiness to the nose and then incorporating it a little more into the chin. And she has actually a little bit more of the um, cheek color down in here too because the ball of the chin, while we do have this whole area kind of considered a cool zone, um, the ball of the chin usually picks up just a little bit more um, of that red, just in that little tip of the chin. Um, let me just go ahead and take this side plane and show you what the difference would be if we took that and pushed it down in value. And oftentimes you might find that that same color or something very similar exists on this side and as it transitions into the shadow. Your shadow color in the nose actually feels pretty good. So let's take a look at what it would look like if we went ahead and just brought this down a little bit more. I realized that her whole um, her whole chin area is actually um, there's a little bit of reflected light under there, but I'm just talking about. And then of course there's these darker colors back in here. So maybe just learning to um, push that contrast a little bit. Um, especially where we have our cast shadow. And the core shadow. So just taking a quick look at how that might influence some of the other values that you, you placed into the midtones. And it's funny because a lot of times what I find is when my painting's not working, I have to go back and reassess that shadow because what I either do is add too much detail into that shadow or I didn't make my shadow dark enough. And if we don't have that shadow tone to kind of reference, then it throws off all of our other values. So just kind of taking that and also cooling that shadow off Right, it really helped to make the flesh tones in her skin jump forward a little bit more. So those rosy colors um, that you have in her chin, or her cheek, I mean, um, you can see how just making that shadow a little cooler and a little darker really helped get the other flesh tones to pop. Um, this color would also be something maybe you would take a little darker into the eye socket here. I think the nose is right on the mark. Um, and then her side of her hair, hair, you would find yourself also maybe cooling that off just a little bit and pushing that value maybe even a little darker just to build a little more contrast and maybe pushing this back a little bit darker to get that face to pop forward. Yeah, and just that a little extra introduction of that main uh, flesh tone really makes a difference too. And actually I would, I know she has a cooler zone in um, her upper lip 
uh, muzzle area, but maybe a little bit more of a peach tone here and there would also help to incorporate that. Um, I think you did an excellent job. Overall, you, you captured her likeness and you do have most of her colors spot on. So just remember to pay attention to values because um, that's really, I think, where most things kind of started to um, kind of trail off for you is that shadow value. So in the next painting, um, you don't have to edit this one. You're more than welcome to, but um, you don't have to. Uh, but in the medium flesh tone, really pay attention to getting that shadow value. And um, if you don't have one of those value scales that has like the little holes punched in it, um, you might consider buying one uh, because it can really help. Um, the hardest part for us when we're learning color is to detect the difference between chroma and value. So we often will say a color like, let's just say a cadmium red. So let me uh, just do a little demo for everyone. So let's just say, let's take cadmium red. This is pretty close to a cad red. It's maybe a little bright. Let's bring it down a little. Cad red medium or cad red light. So here we have it. So that is about as high chroma as you can get on our um, in terms of our fr straight out of the tube colors, right? It's much more intense and bright. Think back to the apple in that lecture um, than say a burnt sienna. Um, but, so we would say like if you just ask someone, is that a bright red? They would say, yeah, it's really bright. But brightness is actually refers, or brightness or darkness, when we talk about it in terms of painting, it's more about value. So what surprises a lot of people is to look at that and see how dark of a value it is. So something we perceive as being a bright color could have a dark value. Um, so even a bright yellow, uh, like let's take a, a really intense cadmium yellow. Okay. And let's do the same thing. Okay, now in this case, seeing the cad red and the cad yellow next to each other, you probably would have said they were very similar um, in terms of brightness, our, our, our perception. But what we're actually talking about when we say that is chroma. We're talking about, oh, that's such an intense color. Um, so remember that and look at the value difference between the two. So keep that in mind. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Um, all right, Kathy, do you have any questions? All right, so if you if any questions pop up, just uh, type it in the chat box and I'll... All right, perfect. All right, guys. All right, let's go ahead and move on. And like I said, these critiques are going to take a little bit longer than last week, so just hang in there. Go grab a cup of coffee if you need it. All right, Angela. I think I saw you in here. Um, also, just a reminder, if you guys, if I bring up your painting and you go, oh, it doesn't feel that bright in person, that could be the, the camera or maybe my monitor um, coming across too bright. So just let me know if it needs, I need to tone down the brightness a little bit, okay? because I want to give you as accurate of a critique as possible in relation to the color. So Angela, uh, let me know um, if this feels a little bit bright. Um, not compared to the photograph, but compared to how the painting feels in person. Or if you find it's too warm or too cool, just let me know, because I can tweak some of those things in, in this program. All right, so I'll wait for your response. If it's fine, just let me know as well. There is a slight delay between me uh, talking. It's a bit bright. Okay, perfect. Let me just make an adjustment here. There is a slight delay between me talking. It's a bit bright. Okay, perfect. Let me just make an adjustment here. 
I'm going to bring the value down just a little bit. How's that? Is that better? The reason I want to do this for everyone is that um, if it doesn't feel like it does in real life or as close to it, I might be giving you suggestions for your color that you know might not apply. So I want to get it as close as possible. Still a bit bright. Okay, thank you. Let me just try bringing that down. Is that a little better? Because that can be, um, when you take your photograph, um, I, I don't know if you're using a cell phone or a, a camera, but you should be able to adjust the exposure just a little bit to get it to not overexpose in the lights. Um, because that's often, especially on a, uh, a fair skin model, whenever I'm painting someone that's really fair and that high contrast, it's really challenging for the cameras to, to capture it. Um, I have to get out my hefty camera. Um, oh, and I don't know if anyone knew this, but I added um, a picture. So when, in this week's, uh, this previous week's demo, I added a high res photo of my demonstration painting. So. You guys can go in there. It'll be after the photo references. Um, if you look down, it'll say the references of Tay 1, 2, and 3. Um, and then you'll see the demo pick. And you guys can go in and download that now. And I have one for each week. Um, I was just a little late getting it up. So it can help you guys to see. And I tried to edit them so that they're as close to my original painting as possible. Uh, but you guys can go in there and download them. And you can see brush strokes and, you know, a little bit more detail than you can in the videos. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and get started, Angela. Um, this is looking really nice. I think, let's start with the, the shadow tone. Um, your values are good for the shadow. The only thing I would say is maybe this color turned out a little hot. Um, again, it's a, a chroma um, consideration rather than a uh, value. So I think your value is pretty pretty close. So I'm going to just do a quick oops, little sample. Make that a little smaller. I'm going to move this up here. So let's do a little sample of that shadow color. And then I'm going to do a sample of a similar area. So you can see if you squint your eyes, the values are very similar. Um, but your chroma or, and your hue is a little bit more towards the red. So what I would suggest for um, editing that uh, would be taking this color and adding ultramarine blue because that's going to cool it off right away. Um, but that's also going to make it darker. So you want to maintain the value that you have because the value is correct. Um, so then I would also add it needs to go a little more towards yellow. So I would add a little bit of yellow ochre. And if you did that, essentially if you think what you're doing, you're adding a green to a red, and that's going to cancel the red out a little bit. So whenever we're trying to make a flesh tone more neutral, you wanna add the complementary color. So the, uh, essentially you're taking what would make a green, and you're adding it to that red. So when I'm thinking about editing colors and, and I'm modifying colors even as I'm painting, um, I'm always thinking about do I need that chroma to be more neutral or does it need to be more intense? And that kind of guides me as to whether I need to add a, a similar color. Like a, if I wanted it to be more of an intense red, I would add another red to it. Um, or if I needed to tone it back, then I know I need to add the complement color on the color wheel. So that's how I use kind of color theory and color logic as I'm painting flesh tones. And one thing to note is that a lot of flesh tones are way more neutral than we realize. Um, if you look at um, like a Bouguereau painting, 
you will notice that most of his flesh tones, like if we took a Bouguereau painting and brought it into this program and took color samples of the flesh tones, you'd be surprised at how gray most of them are. With the exception of a few of those intense color zones, for example, the cheeks, the nose, the lips, um, where he, and maybe some of the shadows, but he really, and then he'll add like, you know, a red bow or the clothing or something that really helps to pop the chroma. And it, his paintings are obviously really beautiful and, and they feel very real. Um, and it's always surprising to me how gray his flesh tones are. Um, and as a great exercise is to try and do a master copy of his work. It's not easy because he's very controlled with his values, but um, it's a great learning exercise in terms of how neutral you can go with the flesh tones. All right, so um, that being said, let's kind of move over into the light mass. I'm gonna shrink this down just a little bit so we have a little more room. So let's, uh, let me make a note for you that that is shadow. Um, I think your core shadow color is actually pretty good. Um, so this color in here and here, maybe it's a touch red. You might find yourself needing to modify it. Um, sorry, Jenny, I'm not understanding your question. Oh, oh, who was that? Uh, Bouguereau. Uh, B-O-U-G-U-E-R-E-A-U. It's a French name. First name, William. He's one of my favorite painters. In fact, um, when I decided I wanted to be an artist and I was actually going to pursue it, I always loved doing art, but I, to actually make a career of it, I had gone to, I was in high school and I'd gone to a, a museum and I came across, um, I went to the Getty Museum in Los Angeles and uh, it was the first museum I'd ever been to and I came across one of his paintings and it completely blew my mind. And I just decided, and it, I find out later, it's just one of his studies, <laughs> but <clears throat> it actually made me want to become a painter. So I'm a huge fan of Bouguereau paintings. Um, say what you will about the academic art of that period, but um, he and Ang are some of my biggest inspirations. Um, so yeah, check him out. Especially, well, he painted a lot of fair flesh tone models too. So it, I actually had pulled one of his paintings out for our color zones lecture um, for the fair flesh tones. Um, so you can kind of go in and see, and I actually have a print of that particular painting, that portrait um, in my studio for inspiration. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and move over into these half tones right here. Again, I think your value is pretty close. But I'm thinking the color might be a little bit on the red side. So we're going to take a sample of that color. I'm going to make that a little smaller. And then we're going to take a color sample here. And what can happen if you make some one color too chromatic, like that shadow color, is that then every other color that might feel depends on where I'm taking the color. I'm taking the color from here. It almost seems like the color you have here works better. But if I'm just taking it from the same spot, it just needs to be, again, I think an addition of blue. So if you took this color here and you added ultramarine blue it will darken it because I think your value here might be a little bit on the bright side um, it should give you something close to that um, because this is kind of a, a red peachy orange and I, I think your color over here is almost spot on yeah, you're really close. Actually, 
Yeah, you're really close. Yours might just be on a touch on the green side. And just and you can see that this color here is almost a, a direct reflection of this background. Even though this background is quite dark, you can see that influence kind of purple coming into this area of her skin. And it actually, I think it's influencing this side just a little bit as well. Because the background does extend over this way. So if maybe what I would do is take, let's take a sample of that color there. Well, maybe I'll go, I'll go like right here. And then go for a similar spot. You're really close. I think you actually have something very close to the, the right um, hue and even the right um, chroma, but this is maybe a little bit darker. Um, get my pen out here. So let me reverse these. Hold on. I think I. Just flip those around because the one on the left is your your color. I don't want those to get confusing. So um, so this is your color here. So I would say just a tiny touch of blue would would give you the right color. Um, so I'll just make a note. And you'll you're probably seeing a trend here. Um, we start off with the shadow, and you're having to add ultramarine blue. This one, same thing. This one, same thing. So I think what's happening is that, again, that shadow color being so hot, yes, this color feels appropriate um, in terms of the painting. Um, it feels cooler, for example, than the shadow color um, because that chroma is so intense. But once you get the correct shadow color, the other colors might feel too warm by comparison. Does that make sense? All right, so um, I think, again, your average flesh tone, which I would say is probably this one here. Um, I can see it here too. Looks really good. Um, possibly a little bright, but that could just be the photograph because you said the photo was a little light, so the camera might have not quite picked it up. If I take something from the same area, her flesh tone is maybe just a slight amount cooler um, pink. It kind of depends on where I take that though, because if I take it from that other side, um, your value is actually closer. And I realize you might have blended and, and that sort of thing. Um, maybe just a little bit more pink for her average flesh tone. It, it's not a huge distinct difference though, because when I, I kind of zoom out, I can sense um, her, her skin tone. The only thing I would say is that maybe you could have utilized more of this color um, throughout her portrait and the, the highlight color, like for example, the whole forehead here feels a little bit brighter than it should be um, just by a, a little bit. And you can, in another area, um, I know Jenny, you had a, a question about what areas I was comparing to find that average flesh tone. And I will be posting those diagrams. I'm, I'm gonna work on those um, probably tomorrow, um, but just to help everyone. Um, but essentially, like if I'm having a hard time finding a spot on the face, um, for example, on this model, I think I use maybe this spot here and then like right in here, not where it was real pink, but somewhere close. Um, but you can also use an area like the chest, um, somewhere where the color feels like a good average um, that you tend to see throughout the whole portrait. So, um, so like even like right in here, that seems really close, even though it's a little bit cooler. And cooler, it kind of depends. Um, but I try to just find what is the overall influencing color? And that takes some time to learn how to see. Um, and even for me, it's a challenge to find. And I don't always hit the mark. I find that I might end up estimating that at too dark or too light. 
um, and I have to adjust it as I'm painting. So it's okay if you, you feel like oh, I'm not getting it um, right, right off the bat. It's just a matter of trying to find it and being aware of it, that it does exist. And in the lecture, this, the, in the new lessons for this week, we talk about undertones. And that is another thing that can take some time to learn how to see. But um, tell me to look for certain colors. And I thought they were crazy. I'm like, those colors don't exist. I don't see any purples in the skin. You know, I just see pink or I just see orange. Um, but over time, I started to see what they meant. Um, and it was a matter of teaching myself to look for it. And as you continue to look for it, you will start to see it more and more. And the same thing goes whenever you're just learning something new. It's like your eyes need to learn how to see before you can actually recognize it. Um, because all of this is new, it's foreign, and it's unfamiliar. I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, so, I, and like for example, um, Angela, with yours, like here, if we look at her average flesh tone for the chest, and maybe yours, I would say here, even though this maybe got a little bit light down here, I'm going to take that color. You can see that maybe you had just a touch more yellow in your mixture, but that it's actually pretty good. It's really, really close. I think you actually nailed the color over here um, in her arm. So I'm going to do a quick little paint over for you. And um, just on a few areas that I think would help. And first, let's start with that shadow and see how that changes the feeling of the painting. So I'm going to take that sample there. And it's going to feel really gray by comparison to that red. But it's also going to change how you perceive um, some of her, her flesh tones. Yeah, that's pretty close. Um, And they do get maybe a little bit more um, kind of reddish and dark. I actually like the color you have in here, so I would keep some of that. So you can see how that now, um, that color, now this color feels too red by comparison. Whereas before it felt cooler by comparison to that shadow. Um, so then we take the slightly cooler version of that color and start to introduce it back in that half tone. And I would say she actually maybe has a little bit more of a warm core shadow than I would even maybe just for the sake of the painting, make that core shadow a little bit warmer. You know, it's okay to have a little bit um, something a little bit different than the photo if it works for the whole painting. But you can see how then taking this into more of a, a purple gray, it's kind of a rough paint over, but um, you can see how that would help. And even she has like a slightly lighter version of that. Kind of transitioning out. She has a lot of these cool undertone, uh, cool tones in her, her flesh. And she has a very kind of pink undertone in some areas. Though I find that she has a little combination of, of both. Um, more of that yellow undertone and the pink. Um, it kind of depends on where you're looking. But you can see just from that how it changes the perception of those pinker flesh tones. Um, that you have in there that are working really well. Does that make sense? Um, and then the only other suggestion I had was up in that forehead, she has more of um, that average flesh tone. So I'm going to just take you the one you have, which is a really beautiful color. Um, and I would just incorporate a little more of that so that that highlight takes up just a smaller portion in the portrait. And even on this far side, maybe a little bit, incorporating a little more. Um, 
maybe a touch of it in here. Although this area may be, oops, it's a little bit dark. Yeah, I think you actually have a good color in there. So let's look at that comparison there. So it's, it's very subtle, but um, you can see how that helps to balance out the flesh tones. Uh, do you have any questions, Angela? I think you did a great job. Um, again, it just comes down to getting that chroma in that shadow, and I think you would have something that looks um, just like her. And just to repeat myself, you don't have to go in and edit these because you guys have a lot of homework coming up too because we're doing a new painting each week. Um, but don't feel like you have to have it looking like a finished painting. If you want to leave it tiled, you can leave it tiled. Um, you don't have to go through and blend it out. So I just want to put that out there uh, for all of you guys. You're very welcome. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Colin, I know I think you said you weren't going to be able to attend... Uh, live but that you might catch it later so I'm gonna uh, my feeling is that your painting photograph of your painting is a little bit on the bright side so I'm going to just bring that down that probably feels a little bit more like it in person I'm just kind of guessing but um, and uh, yeah I think you did a beautiful job on this um, I would say oh and thank you for sending a picture of your palette you guys are more than welcome to send me a picture of the palette. Um, it can be helpful for me to see the actual color um, that you're utilizing in your paintings, but it's not required. Um, it just can be helpful on occasion. Oops. All right, so um, let me just move some of this around. In fact, I think I'm gonna, hold on just a second, guys. I'm gonna just kind of crop this in so I can just focus on the portrait. And you guys are more than welcome to utilize these references um, after this class. That's why I provide more than one. Um, if you want to go back and revisit and uh, work on more, you know, advanced color studies or paintings, these references are for you guys for you guys to use. So don't feel bad if you want to, you know, create some paintings from it. Um, they are for your free use, no copyright or anything. Um, okay, so let me get started here. So you captured a really nice likeness of the model, and I think a majority of your colors are in a good uh, zone. The only thing I would say is that the contrast between the light and the shadow could use a little bit more of a bump. Um, and I think namely in that shadow. So let me get my filberts. And I just want to take a quick sample. Um, I think you're in the right color family, although it could maybe need to be a little bit on the cooler side. But for that shadow there, we have that color. I would say that's kind of like her average shadow. It's somewhere in the middle here. Um, she does have darker shadows and she does have a slightly lighter uh, reflected light like down here in the neck. Um, but if I just take that average shadow value and compare it to yours here, you can see that there is a pretty distinct value difference and it almost feels like you might have added a little bit of white to that shadow color. Um, and as a result, what happens is when we make these values opaque and also on the lighter side, it pushes the values from the light mass up in value as well and leaves less room for a nice chromatic kind of transition in these mid-tone areas. So just keep that in mind. Um, so I would say let me uh, take these here and flip them here real quick. <clears throat> I did that backwards again. 
Um, okay, so what I would do is take the color that you maybe have, or maybe even start with a fresh color, because this looks like it has white in it. If you did, did add white to it, I would start with maybe a fresh mixture. Um, if not, it depends on how much white, but you might take that color and I would say add a little bit more blue um, and burnt sienna. So I would say maybe add the burnt sienna first to start to get it nice and dark and then add a little bit of ultramarine blue to help to get it a little bit more in neutral because that burnt sienna is going to be very, very warm. And let's go ahead and take just a look at a few other areas here. So as a result, you can kind of see how this value has been pushed on to the, into the lighter side um, compared to the value you have here in the cheek. Um, and I'll even take the slightly darker sample. So you can see there's a pretty significant value difference. And part of that is that fall off of white. So this time we have um, almost a Rembrandt lighting, which is where you get that little triangle of light on that cheek. Um, and just remember that there's going to be a distinct value difference between the average light tone over here for her, which is like in this range, and the average light tone, even if we took the lighter version of that on that side. So that's that fall off of light that I'm talking about. So um, let me take a few more color samples first and then we'll talk about how to modify this. Um, and then I think down here is where you know, because you have such a limited range to work with in terms of values because of the shadow, I think down here you could push your values a little bit darker as that form rounds down on that side plane. So I'm going to take a sample of that side plane. This is your color. And then we're going to take the same spot here. And it's just a little bit on the cooler side than what you have. Um, again, in that chin, too, you can see that difference um, in value. Okay, so let's let's start off with... Oh, and then let's look at her um, average. So that one's actually not too far off, so maybe I'll skip that one, and we will talk about her average flesh tone uh, for the light mass. So I think it, I'm going to take that color from here for this photo reference, and then we'll take it from here. Okay, so in this case, you could actually go maybe a little bit brighter with that average flesh tone. Is everyone hanging in there okay? All right, so um, let's talk about, so this was that, uh, this is shadow. This is right cheek light. Okay, so um, what I would do to get, this is your color, so what I would do to get there would be to maybe add a little bit of, probably maybe alizarin because we want to kind of have it cool off and maybe a little bit of ochre. That might give you that color exactly. And if it feels too, if it feels too hot of a color, maybe a little bit of ultramarine blue question mark. So um, that should, that should give you that color there. Um, and then here, this could just be a slightly darker value because of the canvas weave. Um, I'm taking a color sample and you can see it changes quite a bit. Um, but I would just say maybe you could go a little bit lighter um, towards the top and maybe push some of the chroma in the cheek a little darker and that can create some nice contrast. So let me grab my 
color here. So if I look down in like the apple of her cheek where it should be very, very pink, and then I grab the apple of her cheek where it's a little bit, so you can see she has maybe a little bit more of a rosy pink quality um, and your colors are a little bit less chromatic. So you might try pumping up the chroma in those areas just a little bit by adding a touch of alizarin. She has that cooler, you know, remember looking back at our color chart. So I would say add maybe alizarin. This is left. Uh, cheek. And this is maybe the average t flesh tone. So just maybe a little bit more um, of a cool pink. Again, you might find alizarin or alizarin substitute works. Maybe a little cad red. Although that's going to make it more of a peachy kind of red. Um, oops, hold on, let me try that again. I'm just going to try and space these notes out a little bit for you. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Let me do a quick paint over using these colors so we can kind of see how they would uh, differentiate the painting. So starting namely with that shadow, getting that shadow appropriately dark. I think I'm gonna use a different brush. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of generally softly apply that. She has a lot more shadow in this um, photo reference than the one I painted. And you could probably push this value back here and maybe her hair value as a result a little bit into the dark a little bit more. And it is actually slightly more neutral, even though we sense those red tones in areas. Um, her shadow has a little bit of that complementary color in it. So remember that even in the hair, she has this coppery kind of red hair in her shadow. It's going to contain a little bit of that green, just a touch. So you can see even giving that appropriate contrast to the um, shadows even behind the head um, can help a lot as well. And she does have kind of a slightly darker core shadow in a few areas. In the cheek, it appears as maybe more of an intense kind of red, um, whereas in the chin, it comes across as more of a, a gray. And even though we see reflected light in here, it's still part of the shadow mass in here for that eye. And it gets maybe a little bit darker in that inner part of the, the side plane of the nose. Cast shadows usually also have a little bit more of an intense um, dark because this jawline is getting some of that reflected light. So you could probably push that a little bit. And then let's take that cheek here and just tile in more of that rosy color. And let's take a look at what difference that's made. So it's given a little bit more range for your lights to for you to push that chroma. Um, and I would even say in here, I would even go I think the photo is even a little bit washed out. Just to make the painting a little more interesting, I would go a little bit more intense with that chroma there and maybe a little bit in the nose and a little bit in that ball of the chin. Though her chin is a little bit on the darker side because of that fall off of light, if 
very similar to what's happening here on this cheek. So I would maybe incorporate some of that pink tone uh, down there as well. And also, um, just a note for everyone, the whites of the eyes um, don't need to necessarily be white. Pay attention to how dark the value comes across. You might have to go in and darken her eyes um, first. And then you'll start to see how that value is actually kind of a darker gray and it'll feel more appropriate just because it's in the shadow. Now in this eye even, um, this is a sphere. The eye gets a little more light here, but it, it's still kind of a slightly darker value here. And this underplane gets just a shade darker um, in that eye socket hollow. So that's gonna add some dimension and form uh, to that area as well and help to separate the bridge of the nose um, just a little bit. It's very gradual, but it will help to add a little bit more dimension to the portrait. The lips also could probably use a little bit more of a pop in that cooler pink um, middle zone. So maybe don't be afraid to push the chroma um, in those areas. And like I said, with like a bureau painting or some of the other ones, Oftentimes, a lot of the skin tones are kind of on the neutral side until you get to these areas like the lips. And then there's that really intense pop of, of color. And you can even see like in this picture um, how it gets a little bit more red right before it touches on to into that shadow. So kind of rosying up that with a tile will help to um, add a little bit more color to the face as well. All right, really nice job though. I think just some of those major um, changes have to do with the values of the shadow. I'd say that was the biggest um, influencer. So I'll send you a paint over of this as well um, with the notes. All right, Susan. Um, let me know, Susan, if this is looking like um, the like your painting, if the values are too bright or if the chroma is, or not the chroma, but the um, hue is shifting towards yellow. I noticed that your color chart uh, had a little bit of a yellow cast to it um, in the picture, so I already adjusted that based on just like a neutral gray. Um, but let me know if the portrait here how it feels compared to your painting in real life, and I'll make some adjustments. Um, as far as your color chart goes, while I'm waiting for you to respond, um, your color chart looks great. I think uh, you have a nice range in your values. Maybe these got a little bit washed out, but that could just be the picture. Um, if you can see the color influence in these, um, then that's all that matters so long as you have it. Um, like this one almost feels like it goes pink as opposed to yellow, but the actual painting is quite cool. Okay, so like for example in the shadows, let me adjust some of the color balance here. So would you say it has like probably less, oh, hold on, let me get on the right layer. That would help. Color influence in the lights, so maybe a little bit more saturation in the lights. That could be a curves thing. Uh, let me try bringing this down a little bit. How's that looking? Is it too pink? I get the feeling like it might be a little pink. All 
right. Is that closer for you? It's too pink. Okay. I'll take it away from that pink a little bit. Maybe take out some of the red. How does that look? Okay, perfect. All right, so let's go ahead and, and dive in. I'm gonna um, take your color chart away. Let me just bring this up here. All right, so um, I think I want this picture a little bigger since we're so focused on the portrait. Crop it in a little bit. All right. Um, okay, so I think your shadow value on the face is actually working really well. I think you got the chroma and the the value pretty spot on. Um, as you can see, even with the color picker here, it changes a lot throughout. But I'd say overall, um, when I'm squinting, I think your values look good. So. Um, the only thing I would say is maybe back in here. Now this just looks like it's sink, sunk in for the painting. So, um, but I think that looks great. Um, the hair color feels maybe a little hot. Um, and I even noticed this in my painting, um, later on was that I, I probably could have darkened her hair a little bit. Um, so if we took like an average, I'm going to take the lighter average for her hair. And then kind of an average for her hair here. Um, I think that will, if you bring that a little bit darker, it would help to set off uh, her flesh tones a little bit more. Um, so that's, that's just the hair. Let me make a note of that. So you want to go from that to that. So I would just say a little bit of ultramarine blue should do the trick uh, to get you something a little bit on the darker side. And also it would kind of help cool it off because I do feel like that color is so hot in the uh, hair that it's kind of drowning out some of maybe the warmer colors that you have in, in the skin tones. Even though her skin tone is very cool pink, um, that relationship sometimes having a really hot color somewhere in the painting can make the flush tones feel like washed out and i often find that like if you have a model with really pale skin and you put them against like a really red hot um, backdrop like if you put them against a cadmium red backdrop their skin tones are going to look so green by comparison um, that it's really tricky to kind of balance yeah and the hair color can throw you off and so you actually have good shadows. Maybe they're a little hot, but I, I feel like your shadows feel really good. But maybe that hair color is throwing off the painting. And we'll do a little paint over in a little bit so you can see how maybe um, that could be influencing the way we're seeing some of the flesh tones. Um, so let's look now at the average flesh tone. I'm gonna kind of take it from, this feels very rosy, I think. Maybe somewhere right around there. So that's um, yours. Here, I'm going to try and stay consistent. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to take the same kind of average flesh tone. Very similar area, maybe right there. So, hmm, that's interesting. Um, yours is actually a little bit more yellow than the reference, but I don't feel that in the painting. Um, so I think it is that hair kind of throwing things off. Um, so I'm gonna just take a few other samples. Let's take this one down here. 
and then take yours, similar spot. Hmm. Maybe I'll take a sample from up here. Her forehead is quite light. Yeah, and it could be the photo kind of washing out, but um, so it looks like you might have a little bit more yellow in your mixtures, just a touch, but it could also be the camera uh, coming across. But it's funny because I would say overall your painting feels very cool. So when I'm making that direct comparison, what my thoughts are is that maybe that hair color is throwing off the way these feel. So just really quick, I want to do that paint over. I'm going to go ahead and jump to that because I think we're going to see the difference um, as soon as I go a little bit darker and more neutral with that hair color. And her hair color even gets even darker down here. It really is almost a direct reflection of those shadow colors in her face. Um, and then up here, they maybe get a more into like an ochre rather than a, she has that red undertone. Um, like we can see it definitely like in here, but it's kind of limited um, to like a transition. And even then it's still maybe a little less red. And it's funny because I always find that whenever I'm painting um, someone where there's like a really, they're wearing a really bright red shirt, it can be challenging to get those flesh tones to feel uh, rich enough. Um, it can really, really influence that. I'm just going to, I know this area is probably just sunk in, but I just wanted to see how adjusting some of the flesh or the color in the hair Maybe more into a yellow rather than a red. She has red in like the transitions, right? Like a little haloing effect. Um, but you can see how that changes our perception of her, her skin tones. Um, the only other thing I would say is maybe some of the values in these transitions. Let's try checking that color there. This might be a little bit on the cool side. And um, let me do that with a better brush. Um, so yeah, so if you take what's actually there and what you have, it's a little bit cooler. So maybe even introducing a few areas of more of that rosy color. Just as that form turns, it might help to, especially like back in here, you can see it picks up a little bit more of like a, it's cool, but it's not as cool as we get in other areas. And then we get into that kind of cooler, um, fleshy pink right through here and kind of maybe popping that rose color a little bit more. Um, maybe a lizard would be good. You can kind of push that. And maybe even utilizing some of your average flesh tone a little bit more before those highlights. That can help to give the illusion of more color. Um, and then the only exception was this side here where she goes a little bit more just a little bit more green than kind of purple in this lower half here. And that can add kind of a nice dynamic to, I think maybe your purple was just a little too pronounced and it should be maybe more of a neutral gray, um, which appears kind of more green to our eyes if you compare these two values here. And it gets maybe more into that pink or purple color as you move up into the cheekbone.
before it turns real kind of rosy. I think you have that nice um, color, rosy color in the chin here, and I would keep some of that. It just kind of sculpts the form a little bit more. Okay, so you were working from a print and it looked quite cool and purple. That can be part of the influence too. Um, if you are working from a certain type of printer and it has a tendency to go towards one way or the other, um, that can influence it as well. So just take uh, some of my suggestions, you know, um, let me make some notes for you. But if, if you're feeling like, oh, well, it's partly, it does feel a little bit closer to my print um, and obviously different than the monitors showing, uh, that's fine. Just keep that in mind. I think this, okay, so this was hair. This was uh, average. Um, so this was, uh, I'm going to point the arrow so it goes from yours to the other one. Uh, so this is the photo reference. So just to keep that in mind. Um, this was the side plane on the left near jaw. And then this was, I believe, the transition... Where did I take this color from? I think it was right in here. So this was um, cheek, oops. On the right. Um, and yours was just a little bit on the light side, I believe. So you wanna go a little bit darker um, and push that contrast. Um, so, Susan, if you're seeing like a, a difference in the color between the print and what these edits are, uh, still try and like look at these areas and see if you see a distinct difference, especially that hair color. I think that could be one of the major things that's throwing it off. Um, let me catch up with your question here. Ah, so that's a great question, Susan. So her question is, um, you don't really see a yellow zone in the forehead, and if you don't see it warmer, should you paint it that way anyway? Um, no. So, and I, I think I should have mentioned this in, and I kind of forgot to when I was doing the lecture. Um, it is considered the yellow zone, but you, you really tend to see that most in, like, Dutch portraiture. Um, they really, really emphasize that. Um, it doesn't always exist. So what I like to think of as the forehead as is a yellow slash neutral zone because it depends on the person's skin tone. And I want to explain a little bit of the logic as to why it's a yellow zone. Um, if you think about the, the face um, structure, if you look at areas where the bone of the skull comes to the surface and there isn't as much um, tissue uh, or muscle or fat um, layered between the bone of the skull and the surface of the skin, then in those areas you're going to get more of that influence of that um, kind of yellow color. So for example, if you think about the ball of the forehead that's in the center of the forehead right up here and her bangs are covering it, right? Um, you actually might see a little bit more yellow there. But when we start getting down into here, we have the brow muscles, right? Um, that help us raise and lower our brow. And there is a thin amount over here too, but it's primarily through here. And then of course we have all this tissue happening. Um, so you might see a slight yellowing through um, the upper forehead. And if, and if not, you also see, tend to see more neutral or cool colors. So it'll be more of like the average flesh tone. It might be less um, pink 
than the cheeks. So the reason we get this as that red zone is because the, all the capillaries come to the surface and create that kind of rosiness. Um, same thing with the ball of the nose. It tends to have a little bit more red. Occasionally you will see it through here. It depends on the person. But sometimes you will also see this come through as more yellow because the cartilage. Again, it's like that bone coming to the surface. Um, so if you even just feel around on your face, you can kind of feel where the bone comes to the surface in a few areas where there's not as much tissue and you will tend to get maybe a slight more neutral or yellow color in that area or sometimes it's even cooler. So it kind of varies um, and it's harder to see on someone who is darker skin um, than someone who is uh, more fair because fair skin tends to have a little more translucency. So um, when someone's really really fair, gray um, color zones um, and you do get like a slight yellowing through here as you can see it kind of goes more into like a green so um, and that maybe that'll make more sense too when we talk about the undertones of the face um, in the lecture for this week um, because when I talk about green green contains yellow so when I say it's a yellow zone you might be seeing more green there as opposed to like uh, like in here it goes more purple down here it goes more um, green gray so it's more about just having an awareness um, and, and you know some people it will be really prominent and also it depends on the person like if someone who spends a lot of time out in the Sun you actually might end up with more red or um, like a, a brown or, or you know tan skin on the forehead. If they spend a lot of time out in the sun, you're going to see some of that in the forehead because that's the first spot that gets hit with the sun. So you might see someone who has actually more color up in the top part of the forehead. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. It's, it's kind of a relative idea. It's a concept that you just want to be aware of and start to look for in your portraiture because sometimes you will see it um, but most importantly is paying attention to that red zone versus that cool green zone. And you can see it quite distinct on her here. It kind of goes more into like that green. And if we compare that to something like here, we have more of that pink. So, um, and when we're using terms like green and pink, they're pretty muted versions of those colors. They're pretty uh, low chroma. Just when you compare them next to each other, like I wouldn't necessarily call this a green um, outright if you just took the color on its own and just you know I wouldn't say, call that necessarily a green um, or even if I took this one over here right it depends on what it's next to um, if we then put that next to this color though you see how it looks green by comparison so it might not be an actual olive green as if I mixed yellow ochre and, and blue um, but it's going to have a little bit more of that green appearance next to that red zone of the face so just let's go ahead and do a little sample like here's forehead color and on her it's actually quite maybe I'll take it from over here quite pink it's kind of like her average flesh tone because she is quite pink um, and then we take something like the cheek even if I go, and that's definitely more pink and chromatic. And then we jump down here and suddenly it cools. So it, it does have that, um, that general trend. And that's the idea. Okay, does that make sense for everyone? Yeah, and I don't want anyone to um, feel like, you know, you're, just because you can't see it doesn't mean, you know, you're wrong. <laughs> it's just, these are the concepts that it took me a while to learn to see them. So if you can't see it right now, just keep um, kind of like notes and your, your, as you, every time you approach a painting, you want to look at these, look for these um, concepts. It's kind of like, I compare it to drawing head construction. Um, for those of you who are familiar with like a more construction approach to drawing the head, um, you know, we draw all these, like, if you're familiar, if you've heard of, like, the Riley method or the um, Loomis method, 
you draw all these like construction lines, but they're not necessarily literal. Um, some are, but it's not like a literal thing you see on the surface. The side, the planes of the head are not always the most obvious. Um, and it's, you know, they do, but the concept behind it does exist and the structure is there. Um, you just have to know how to look for it. But it's just because, you know, we talk about rhythms or, um, you know, side planes doesn't mean they're always the most obvious to us to see. But as you continue to learn um, and you continue to look for it, you will start to see it and you will see it as like a, um, a concept that will aid you in making your decisions when it comes to color mixing, if that makes sense. Yo, you're very welcome. Great job. All right, Beth. Are you in here, Beth? Just wanted to see if your painting was a little bit on the bright side. I kind of feel like it might be just because of the um, feeling in some of the background. So how is that looking to you? Is that a little better or, is it, or did I darken it too much? That might have been, made it a little dark, huh? It's a little bright. Okay. You can bring the brightness down. And I might, it, and sometimes when you're adjusting these things with photos, you might have to adjust the saturation too, just a little bit. Um, how does that feel in terms of color for you? Is that too warm? Is it too cool? Is it too saturated? And let me know if you see, like, if the color balance needs adjusting, if it's too pink or that seems close. Okay. All right. So let's leave it at that then. All right. Let me just move this here. Okay. I'm going to crop down here just a little bit. We don't. Your, your colors for her shirt were pretty good, so I'm not going to worry about that. Um, okay, so... And if you have any uh, specific questions, Beth, go ahead and, and write them in. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start where we started with everyone else with those shadow colors. Um, as you can see, the shadow colors seem a little hot, and I think um, that seems to be a pretty common thing. Um, so one thing to kind of note for everyone, um, when I'm mixing a shadow color, it's easy to go to warm initially. Um, and so if you're finding that's the case, just remember to add a little bit of the complementary color. So a, essentially a green. So you'd add a little bit more ochre, maybe a little bit more um, blue essentially to, it'll darken the color, but it'll also kind of gray it out just a touch. Think of shadows. Now shadows are probably, you know, in our lighting situation, we have a warm shadow, cool light. So that that's appropriate. But often also shadows are um, a little less chromatic because we're not seeing much light in there. Um, so keep that in mind as well. So even though it might be warmer than the lights in like this case, um, they're often a little less chromatic. Now that can depend um, if we have like the environmental influence bouncing more color in the shadow like you saw in the sorrow heads um, examples that I gave you guys. In those cases the shadows were the most chromatic areas right um, but it can, it can these are all factors that we want to think about as we're analyzing um, the portrait that we're painting. Um, so my suggestion would be Let's start with the average shadow color here, and then we'll talk a little bit maybe about the reflected light. So let's take a sample of that. 
So there's your color, very, very red. And I'll actually, I'll do this simultaneously below. And then let's take her average shadow here. And then this one here. That was similar area. Um, okay, so let's take a few notes on that. So again, this is what I meant by the color reading kind of hot. Um, you can see that you're actually, your value is very, very close. So this color would be really easy to fix. Um, it would just be, um, this is that average shadow that we have here in the hollow of the cheek, kind of like in this zone. Um, that would just be the addition of ultramarine blue and maybe a little yellow ochre if that ultramarine blue doesn't do the trick on its own. Um, but I think ultramarine blue alone would probably do that. It would darken it to the right value and also kind of take out some of that red. Um, this color, I think what happened is your reflected light got a little too saturated and too bright. So you can see that the value difference between here and here is very slight. It does exist, but it's not as exaggerated. Um, so for this color, I would say an addition of, of course, you, ultramarine blue, because that's going to gray it out, and then um, yellow ochre. You could maybe use um, burnt sienna, but I really feel like there's so much red in here. You probably used a little cad red maybe in that mixture. Um, that would help to kind of neutralize that. So I'm going to say this is average shadow. This is reflective light within the shadow. Just to give you some notes there. I'll space this out. Okay. Um, okay, so let's look now and as you've seen in some of the previous um, critiques, that shadow color is going to influence your lights um, and how they feel. So we'll work on addressing that as well. And I think the hair goes pretty much goes the same. It probably needs to be more in like the ochre range. Um, so something actually closer to those shadow colors. So we'll do that in the paint over. Um, so let's look at a few other areas. I think this color is really nice here, but down here it could maybe cool off a little bit. Let's check though. I'll take it for, yeah. So it could, it could, go, you're in a very similar color family. Um, you're kind of in that mauve kind of color family, but I think maybe pushing that more towards blue would help. Um, so let me make a note of that. So this is kind of this area here. Right cheek near shadow. Oops. Um, and so, yeah, I think for that one, it would just be another addition of ultramarine blue. That should do it, but if not, you might find yourself wanting to introduce a little bit of, um, if that goes to like cool purple, you might throw in a little ochre and alizarin. Um, but I'm thinking just blue. So I'll leave that just as a note for um, blue. But if it goes too cool on you, then you might try warming it up again. Um, it also go, goes a little darker and I think that would help as well. So let's look at average flesh tone, which I'd say, which, which area do you think is the average flesh tone for you? I would, I was, I'm kind of leaning towards this, but when I look in the forehead, it looks um, a bit cooler. Would you say like this area here? 
was close to your average flesh tone. Forehead. Okay, forehead is closer. Okay. Um, all right, so I will keep that in mind here. Okay, it's not actually that big of a difference, so I think what I'll do is just use that forehead area right in here. And I'll actually just take that average color from her forehead. All right, it looks like you have a color match there, so that looks great. Where I feel like maybe you could enhance some of the color is maybe here in the cheek. You might be a little pale. And it's not a huge difference, but you can see how... Let me swap those real quick. So that is... That's what yours is in that area, and then hers. I'm taking it like just below the eye or kind of in the middle of that apple of the cheek kind of as an average. So you can go a little bit more pink in that area. And I think that would help maybe the forehead not feel so similar to this part of the cheek here. And I'll do that in the paint over so you can see as well. I think you have a good color here. Let me take that again here. Try and get an average for that area. Yeah, you're really close to that color. So you, yours might have a slight amount of yellow, but I really don't think that's um, enough to change that. Um, maybe it's just a little light on this side where you have this little bit of light coming in. It gets a little bit darker as this kind of creeps back into that shape. So maybe you would just end up taking some of this color and this color and kind of finding a value in between the two. Um, so like taking that kind of gray green that you have down here and this mob tone and connecting them a little bit. Let me compare that to this same area. So yeah, and I think maybe the forehead, it feels a little pale to me. I think she has a little bit more color. So you could probably take more of, um, a little bit more of some of the pink that you see here in the cheek and add a tiny bit up in the forehead right where this starts to turn and where we have this um, triangle. So let me just jump into the paint over because I think it's gonna be a little easier to explain. So if I like look at the color in these areas, let me switch brushes here. So where it starts to rotate towards that shadow edge. And then actually she has maybe a few more steps of like a, a kind of greenish color um, that kind of comes in to here. But more of some of this color like through the keystone shape. And you'll kind of notice this. Some people go really cool gray in here, like as it comes towards that shadow. But they're also on women, I notice it tends to go very pink right through here. Um, and on men, sometimes they have a little bit of hair here, or not like a full unibrow, but a little bit of hair or a little fuzz, and it tends to go more gray. Um, but you just kind of look in that area, and I think a little more chroma kind of leading up to the highlight maybe would help that highlight pop out a little bit more. Maybe having another cool transition tone somewhere in there. And then I do think definitely having more of her average flesh tone and also a little more of her pink. Um, just a little more chromatic in a few areas, looking in the nose here, 
just a little bit more, kind of popping that color um, just a touch. And her, her side plane of her nose does kind of take on more of a distinct um, kind of color. It's very similar to the color we see back in here or like riding right along the edge of that shadow. This is always a tricky area of the face too because we start off kind of grayish and then it goes into like more of a rosy transition from that shadow through this area. So at some point it goes from being more of a gray to being more of like this mauve um, tone right along that shadow edge. And you might find yourself wanting to add even another step maybe between the two if you feel like the values are jumping too quickly then maybe you need to push something right in this zone that's somewhere in between that pink and that kind of darker uh, color. The underplanes to the eyes are a little bit darker than they they seem in the picture um, and that's because it's an underplane so I think maybe going a little bit darker gray would help to get that plane to feel like it turns under. And yeah, I think you're in the right color family here, just maybe more of utilizing more of that gray kind of in this lower zone to help get that form to turn under. And she has a little more of that rosy kind of pink right in her chin before it gets lighter, so maybe introducing some of that as well. She has a tiny bit more kind of a pink in her nose. It's really minor, but it can help again in these areas where we're trying to build a little bit more chroma. And on someone really fair, these transitions are pretty subtle. Um, so let me start with that shadow too. Let's go ahead and jump in and, and change that shadow because it's going to influence some of our perception. So you can see it goes a little bit more yellow and then that reflected light gets toned down just a little bit. And I would say the hair, same thing. There's just a little more blue in that influence color. And it gets a little darker probably right through here and in a few areas. Not all of her hair is real dark, but. And where it does pick up more of that red is in those um, kind of dark transitions. So you can see what a difference that's made um, just on its own. And then if we even introduce some of that up in here and then go maybe a little more ochre in the lights it kind of changes the way the pinks read in her skin. Now red hair is kind of tricky to paint. It's kind of like blonde hair. It, there's a lot more cool tone in blonde hair than we tend to um, believe. Um, at first we tend to go, oh, it's kind of yellowish blonde, but there's a lot of cool grays and, and um, cooler transitions. And the same thing goes with red hair. And if you just go in with that blazing red, um, it's gonna feel kind of artificial. So looking for those kind of, her hair is kind of this copper, but then there's these, you can see these kind of coolish grays next to like a more intense coppery red. Um, and that helps to uh, make it feel a little bit more natural. So let's just take that away and just see how that so you can see how much that shadow color um, makes a difference. I'm gonna just, now I'm not correcting drawing, so keep that in mind. I just realized I erased your whole eyebrow. <laughs> um, so 
that's pretty much my main suggestion. I think your flush tones in the chest area look great. Same thing in the arms. You detected some of that warming kind of tan that she picks up in her arms. Um, do you have any questions, Beth? All right, really nice job. Don't, um, I know you were kind of hesitant to uh, turn in work like everyone else. <laughs> I just want everyone to feel like, you know, this, remember this week's demo, I leave mine a bit more loose, um, kind of more brushy and I didn't blend a lot out, um, just a few areas. And that's, I, I do that just because I think a lot of people find it really helpful to see the blending stage. Um, and I did have someone who wrote, I think it's he's in group B, but he had a question about um, tiling and how to kind of move forward. So like, let's say you only have enough time to paint, you know, part of the face and you leave it tiled and then the next day you try and come in and blend it and the colors have dried. Um, for the purpose of this class, you don't have to worry about blending it out. But if you're wanting to work into your painting again, like in the next day or you know, you run out of time, it's better to go in and just soften a few edges where the ridges of the paint kind of come together because it'll make going back into it later and adjusting a lot easier. But for the purpose of this class, you can leave it fully tiled if you want. That's fine. Um, if it's easier for you in time, in terms of time management and everything, because I realize there's a lot of video to watch and there's um, a lot of work to do. You know, the drawing, you guys have to do the drawing, the color mixing, and the painting in one week. And I realize it's a very tight timeline. Um, so remember to keep it in your head as a study. All right. Jenny, let me just make sure I got the right name here. Um, all right, Jenny. I think I saw you in here earlier, if you're still with us. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the um, color temperature and also how bright the painting feels in the photo, if it's close to what it feels like um, in real life. I realize that this is glare. And I wanted to address your question, Jenny, about the panel versus the brushes that you were using, because I think it might benefit everyone. Um, so you were using the ampersand panels and panel in general is going to be more slick. Um, I like the ampersand because they do have a little bit of drag to them, but if you're not used to it, it can feel really slick to you if you're used to working on like canvas or, you know, um, like a linen panel or something. So, uh, and another thing is it sounds like you were using the rosemary hog bristle brushes. Um, I wrote you an email back just before we got started, but it sounds like your your brush strokes were um, kind of scratching off the paint rather than applying it. And bristle brushes, um, hog hair bristle, um, has a tendency to do that. And I remember being frustrated by those kind of brushes, um, unless I was painting on canvas, right? So as soon as I switched to panel, I had to adjust which brushes I started to use um, to work with panel. Now, if you're wanting a brush that's equivalent to the Trakel that I'm using, um, look for the, um, I, their Trakel are called opals, but I think in Rosemary, it's called the ivory. So her ivory series is the same hair as the opal series for the Trakel. So keep that in mind. Um, so if you're wanting to try out the, um, the same kind of brush I'm using to block in, you will have an easier time on this panel with um, those brushes. So go for the um, ivories for um, rosemary. And I, I always recommend going with a long filbert instead of a short filbert because I find with a stiffer brush, the long filbert has more flex and it won't tend to have a, have a tendency to wipe off your paint, which is frustrating. It's really frustrating when your tools are not working with you. And for a la prima especially, because we're doing everything in one sitting, um, 
it's it's hard to kind of build up those layers and I find that those brushes work really well. Um, you can also be experiencing that if you're not using Gamsel and you're using oil to kind of tone your panel, it's going to slide around on you a little bit more. So you can still even use the ivory brushes with canvas. So if you're more comfortable on canvas, that's perfectly fine too. Um, I just, it, I often find that with the portraiture in particular, the finer the weave canvas, the better you'll have um, a kind of like an end result because the canvas texture can often interfere with the illusion of um, some of the colors and also your edges and it makes it easier if it's a smoother surface um, to see your your colors more accurately so I just want to put that out there and uh, if anyone's having tr trouble with the materials it could be a couple of different things so just write me if you're you know kind of struggling and uh, let me know and I'll try and help you work through that um, these are just materials that I've kind of started to incorporate um, and I did have to adjust um, my working methods because I, I like the surface of panel. Um, I like the way it looks and the way it feels, but I couldn't use the bristle brushes on them. And I used to paint with those, um, but they, they lend themselves more to canvas. So just keep that in mind. Um, okay, so you said the painting is a little bit, should be a little bit darker. So I'm gonna adjust that really quick. First I'll try just bringing the general brightness down. Um, and let me know if also um, the color feels too red or it almost looks a little pink. I can't quite tell if that's just the picture, the photograph of your painting or if your painting is that pink in uh, real life. So let me know if I can adjust some of the color balance for you. Yeah, and you can, and Jenny, if you want to do your next color study on a canvas, that's perfectly fine. Um, I'm at, for my demos, I'm, and I'm finding this just in general for all of Prima painting, it is a little easier to work on if you have a little bit of tooth. Um, so keep that in mind too. So just, but you want the tooth to be very, very fine. So I'm working on a pretty fine uh, linen canvas, um, and it's like triple oil prime. So the, the kind of weave is not as obvious. Okay, so you said it's a little cooler. Do you mean like less yellow? Because um, I could go more blue, but that feels a little extreme. Maybe a little bit less of the red. This photo looks much more pink. Okay, so I think I'm gonna take out some of the, the red here. And maybe I'm gonna I think too much blue too. Let me see how that feels. Let me know how that is. Is that a little better? I could take out some of this pink too. Uh, don't be too hard on yourself, Jenny. <laughs> Remember, we are learning, so that's the key. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I can tell like a few areas maybe got some hot spots of color, um, so we'll address those first. I think part of it is that shadow color being so red. So let's talk about that first. And I probably should have just mentioned to everyone last week that, um, you know, the, the purpose of these paintings is not to, you know, try and make it a perfect painting, even though I know that's what everybody wants. We'd all love to just have every painting we do be, you know, perfect. 
Um, okay, so you said the skin tones are more creamy. I'm thinking you mean maybe a little bit less, um, maybe a little less saturated. Sometimes when you adjust the um, intensity um, of the values, um, it kind of pops the chroma in some areas. This is the hardest part about photographing paintings. I'm thinking I'm going to throw in a little bit more yellow just because it feels a little bit more um, balanced. How does that feel? <clears throat> All right, so we're going to just jump right in here. I'm going to go ahead and crop this real quick. I'm not too concerned about the shirt. Okay, um, and I've got to change your background color to a gray. All right, so <clears throat> let's start with that shadow color um, because it seems to be kind of a common thing for everyone. And mine probably was even a little bit on the warm side. Um, I have to go in and, and look. Um, and I had balanced out some of these pictures of the model um, a little bit too. But there can be a difference between your monitors or whatever you're using a print um, and what you're seeing here. So these are just notes for you to kind of go back and examine. But if you find that, you know, um, you're looking at it, your reference and your painting and those areas are feeling pretty close, then it could just be a difference in the monitor and, and that sort of thing. All right, so if I took that average shadow tone for yours, and I, I have to kind of find an area that doesn't have kind of that sinking in. So here's yours, and then I take an average shadow here. It seems like you're pretty close in terms of um, value, but maybe just a little bit on the red side. Um, I'm going to do, I think where most of that's happening, though, is in that reflected light, and maybe this darkest shadow color. So let's take a couple of samples from those and then we'll talk about how you can um, next time modify your colors. So your value ranges actually seem quite good. Um, so let's take a few notes here. So this is your average shadow. This is reflected light within the neck area and then this is the darkest shadow core. Um, okay so my feeling for this here is just add ultramarine blue. It's going to darken it a little bit and also take away some of that kind of intensity. This one is probably going to be very similar but you can see how red hot this is. And these colors should relate much more closely. So um, I think taking this color, you're adding ultramarine blue and probably a little bit of yellow ochre. And that's gonna give you something a little closer to that color. And the reason for that yellow ochre is, again, we're taking that green and adding it into that red. Um, and then same thing here, you have a very saturated kind of dark red. It's very kind of crimson. And this is just a little bit more gray. Although when I squint, your values are pretty close. Um, I would say just take this color and add a little bit of yellow ochre. And that's going to lighten it. So you're going to want to add a little ultramarine blue. And that's pretty much it. Now you guys are probably noticing a trend amongst all of your guys' work is that it needs maybe a little bit more yellow ochre or a little more ultramarine blue. That seems to be the trend here um, for those shadow colors. So I'm going to just kind of shrink this down here so we have a little more room. 
for our notes. Okay, um, so that was kind of the shadow side. So let's take a look at the lights now. I think what's happening too is because that shadow was a little, this part color was so intense that these colors felt really, really cool by comparison. Um, and they are, they're very cool by comparison. But when we look here, they're just a little less um, saturated, uh, lower chroma. So let's go ahead and take some samples. So I'm going to start with that transition here where you have a very kind of rosy pink. And here is the reference. So it has a little more, um, I would say, ochre and blue in it. Um, I'll make that note here in just a second. So that was that transition. And then let's take let's look at take a look at your average flesh tone. Would you say it's kind of up here in the forehead? Because I'm seeing it kind of like somewhere around here, but maybe a little lighter. Let me know if that doesn't quite feel like what you had mixed on your palette for your average flesh tone. Um, and let's take that there. That seems really close. So maybe just a slight value difference, and that could be the photo. Um, but I think you're in the right family of color. So I don't have any suggestions for that one. Um, there are some areas where this color, yeah, let's, let's address this color here. And like it's here in the forehead where this transitions. So let's take um, your color first, which is very, very hot, um, kind of red peach. And in here, it goes more towards a gray um, neutral. And it could be even that like your pink in here got a little bit chromatic because this area starts to turn under and pick up more of that background color. So I think I'll, I'll address that one as well. All right, so let's take some notes on that. So this was right next to the cheek, um, right cheek, um, next to shadow. So you have a very red color and what we want to do is make it a little bit more like that. So I would say add, start by adding yellow ochre because that is kind of the opposite of a, a purple and we kind of have a red violet here. Um, and then you will probably find yourself needing to darken it again. So I would say a little bit of blue after that. Um, and then with this one, this is that zone up here in the temple. So I'll just say high cheekbone and temple. Um, it's a pretty drastic change, so I don't know if I would just start with a fresh color, but um, maybe if you wanted to neutralize this, because I think it's good to know just in general, like if you have a color that's way off base, how do you get to where you want it to be? Um, I would say you would want to cancel this color out a little bit. So that would be probably mixing a green, greenish color. Um, and so maybe like yellow ochre, blue and white mix it to about the right value and then add it in to that pink. So you'd mix it almost to the same value as that or maybe a little bit darker and that would uh, give you this color here. And then this color, I think just an addition of blue 
uh, would do the trick. Um, so this was kind of the left cheek as it transitions into the jaw. It just needs to take on more of that background color. Um, so you could just add a little bit of blue, I think, to that pink, and you would end up with that color. Let me make my uh, notes a little bit. U UB means ultramarine blue. And you might find it makes it darker, but this is already a lighter value than this one, so I think it would balance it out um, if you made that correction. And these are just notes for you guys. You guys don't have to go in and correct this. If you do and you have time, um, then feel free to email me some edits. But it's really not kind of like built into the course in terms of time because you guys have a whole other painting to do this week. So um, don't stress if you can't quite get it all. Do you have any questions, Jenny? I'm going to do a quick little paint over for you as well. Um, just showing you what this will look like um, with some of the cor corrections. But if you have any other questions about specific areas, um, let me know. So we're going to just, I think that big, the biggest change is this reflected light here. and this um, darker red kind of core color. Now what I'm laying down looks very green by comparison, but it is quite um, red when you compare it to, and like orange, um, when you compare it to the light mass, which kind of has this kind of more violet um, lean in her skin tones. <clears throat> She could probably use a little bit more of a greenish tone down in here too. Um, if you look at that color there, oops, it's kind of similar to what we have up here, just a little bit lighter. Um, it picks up more of that green. So we've adjusted the shadows there um, and she has a little bit of that shadow in here. And then that transition for the temple should be more of a kind of a grayish green. And then the cheek kind of next to the shadow here takes on a little bit more of a neutral color. And then that left cheek jaw area I think that was just in here, just graying it out a little bit. Because I think your pinks look pretty good. Um, they might be a little bit on the cool side, but I think the chroma um, is okay to have, you know, pop out a little bit more in those areas. Another area you might find this kind of neutral tone or even this purpley kind of tone is in that side plane of the nose here. You have to remember any plane that's facing like the background is going to get some of that influence of that color. Um, and the only exception to that is where we see a little bit of the shadow in her nose, um, like in there. Then it picks up that warm uh, shadow color again. I would even say like some of the color from over here could be used in here before it gets um, more pink in that cheek here. A little more pink in that ball of the cheek and then a slightly cooler tone that's maybe a touch lighter Maybe like what you put up here um, in this part of the muzzle. So let's take a look there. So you can see how balancing out just a few of those areas 
um, actually takes what most of what you had um, and kind of puts the colors in the correct relationship. And the hair color actually feels pretty spot on. I would just say a little darker in some areas um, just to provide a little bit more contrast, um, especially towards the top here, right where that she almost has like a core shadow for her hair um, before it turns into more of the color that you had in there. So that could help too. All right, Jenny, do you have any questions? The lips might be a little chromatic um, or dark. Her upper lip is a little more neutral of a, a kind of a mauve tone. Maybe a little ochre in that color and then her bottom lip could go more into like a soft peachy pink. It could be a little bit lighter. Um, the, what helps the lip kind of stand out from the rest of the skin tone is all of this cool gray that comes in like kind of around it. So um, just keep that in mind. But that, that's pretty minor. Yeah, and don't worry, uh, running out of time, it's just, it's part of it. And we're not, you know, going for perfection here. Um, even in my demonstration, you know, I have areas I'm not happy with. <laughs> and I think it's it's kind of normal when you, you have a limited uh, time frame. You know, for the purpose of the demonstrations, I'm trying to keep it, you know, kind of to the point and um, as short as possible because it can take a really long time. Uh, to watch and in fact this week's demo is not nearly as long. I think I spent maybe a little too much time explaining certain things um, in the previous in this demo um, from this week but uh, in your new lesson it is a slightly shorter video so you guys won't have as much time uh, to have to spend watching that. Um, I still go in depth don't worry I'm, I'm not skimping on that but um, I tried to keep it a little bit more to the point and I do leave my painting a little bit more loose um, so you can see how that looks and, and it has actually a slightly different approach to the underpainting um, as far as toning your canvas uh, because I wanted to show people a couple of different options that you have when you're doing uh, your underpaintings. But uh, nice job and, and uh, if anyone goes in and does some editing to their color just reach out to me and if you want like another little bit of feedback um, you can send it to me in, by email or you can post it in our forum and uh, yeah that's pretty much it I know this was a long session so uh, this is kind of the, going to be the pace uh, for the remainder of the class except for the last two weeks where we get to to work on our paintings um, a little bit more um, I will get out those photo references so you guys can start to work on your drawings if you want to. That's completely optional. And I do recommend for that final project um, to work maybe a little larger if you want. You can stay with the 9x12 if you're comfortable with that and you feel like that's good for your time frame. But I'm going to do mine probably around 11 by 14 and that's why I had that also on the um, supply list. But you can stick with 9 by 12 That's fine. So kind of what the class is going to look like moving forward. Um, we have this week's lesson on medium flesh tones and then next weekend you will get a lesson on dark flesh tones and then we'll do our critique for that the weekend after and then we will have our two-week project. So um, you guys can you have some time to think about if you want to do your own two-week project. Um, you can take photo references and start sending them to me if you want. Um, I will send you what we what I have so that you can make a choice if you want to work from one of those as well. Um, Susan, I'm so what I did when I took photos, uh, that's a good question. So she asked, uh, will it be another model for the last two weeks? I'm going to provide references of each of these models um, because I put them under different lighting. Um, and I will have one additional model. It's a male model because I wanted to give some, you know, I realized these are all female and uh, 
So I have one male model and he's kind of like a medium flesh tone. You've seen him in some of the lectures examples. So um, I have that will be also provided, but these are going to be more dynamic in terms of lighting and a little bit more complex. So you can kind of, and it's going to be fun because we're going to be throwing some wild colors into the flesh tones um, and talk about how we can push that uh, beyond what, you know, normal flesh tone, what we consider, you know, normal flesh tones. Um, so I'll send those out so you guys can kind of have an idea and feel free to experiment if you want to take your own pictures um, and I can kind of give you guys an idea of the supplies I used to take pictures. I'm going to have like a little bonus lecture um, towards the end about how I take, you know, set up in my studio for photo shooting models and that sort of thing. So I'll try and get that out um, as well. Does anyone else have, I'd like to just kind of open the floor to everyone watching, um, even if you're not a, a critique student. Uh, if you guys have questions, um, feel free to type it in the chat box. And for everyone getting critiques next week, um, remember we don't have our session on Saturday, we have it on Sunday. Same time zone or same time frame, but it'll be on Sunday. So you have an extra day to submit your work, you can send it to me on Saturday. So if anyone has any questions, it can be about anything, just go ahead and type it in. And if I don't get any, then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. No, oh, thank you, Jenny. All right, everyone. So I don't think anyone has any questions, but um, if you do think of something, you know how to reach me. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I will post this video um, I will post the recording of this in our forum so you can come back and rewatch your critique if you want at a later time. And also I'm going to send you guys emails with your little color notes. Okay, so um, that'll take me a few minutes to send those out, um, but you will get those. Oh, hi, Marilyn. Welcome. Um, all right, Susan. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so the model for this new week, she is a medium flesh tone model, but she has really dark hair. And so one thing you will notice is that her hair does not reflect much color into her shadows because it's black kind of absorbs the light. So um, you won't see as distinct um, of a difference in the shadow colors. That's very true. Um, the same thing goes like if we had a model that had blonde hair, that blonde hair would start to reflect that light into that shadow. Also with um, uh, our model for this week, the medium flesh tone model, she's wearing a black shirt and she doesn't have a lot of skin showing because um, her collar comes kind of high. So that's another thing, Susan, that's influencing that. Um, it's because this model was wearing more of a tank top. All of that chest um, exposed skin was reflecting a lot of light into that shadow. Um, and with the model this week, um, Jasmine, she was wearing a dark shirt and we don't get as much of that reflected light. So that's that environmental influence that we want to pay attention to uh, when we're painting. All right, everyone. Thank you for hanging in there. I know this was a long session and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Feel free to tune in this afternoon if you feel like you haven't gotten enough, but nothing new will be revealed in the second class. It'll pretty much be similar. It's just going to be a little shorter because I have a fewer people in that, that one. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend and I'll see you next Sunday.